Hello, I'm June Edwards, and this is Senior Topics. And I wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. I've got my Merry Christmas shirt on with candy canes and a dove. And I've got uh, Christmas stockings and <laughs> presents and trees and ornaments. And we'll talk about the background to some of those. But I think this is a nostalgic day for me anyway, because we've been together for over a year and a half about 20 months ago is when we started this online class. And today it's coming to an end. And it's bittersweet. I've enjoyed doing it with you. But I'm also excited that I will see you in person in about a month. And we'll be building up our relationship face to face. And we'll be able to get caught up on what's happened over almost the last two years. I know the pandemic has helped many of us uh, face a lot of isolation, face ourselves, face the loss of other relationships, but we've also gained new friends, especially through the internet and face new challenges. I've taken up painting again, which I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm not that great an artist, but I am having fun with it and it makes me happy. So let's go ahead and start with today's lesson, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Starting with December 12th, it is Gingerbread House Day. It is Poinsettia Day. And it is the day that the golf tee was patented in 1899. And I have many friends, including my mother, who enjoyed playing golf in her younger years. The hovercraft was patented in 1955 on this date. And Marconi's radio signal first crossed the Atlantic Ocean in 1901 on the cold, cold December day of the 12th. Looking at December 13, it is National Hot Cocoa Day. And it is also the day that the Susan B. Anthony dollar was coined in 1970. And she was a real pioneer in women's rights. December 14th, the first miniature golf course opened in 1929. And that's about my speed as a golfer. The South Pole was discovered in 1911 on December 14th. Well, what a time of year to discover it. But I guess that's the middle of their summer in the Southern Hemisphere. So maybe it's not as bad as I thought. <clears throat> December 15th is called the Bill of Rights Day. When the Bill of Rights was added to our Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of equality, and many, many other freedoms that we take for granted. December 16th is Beethoven's birthday in 1770. It is also in 1773, the Boston Tea Party that they dressed up as Indians and dumped tea into the Boston Harbor as one of the acts of protest against a very repressive colonial government. It is the day of Los Posadas, which is where the Hispanic people, especially in Mexico, go from door to door, dressed in costume, pretending they're knocking on the door of the inn, trying to find room for the Christ child to be born and secured for a warm winter's night. It is National Chocolate Covering Anything Day. Reminds me we need to bake more cookies and there's always room for cookies. December 17th, the Wright Brothers' first flight, successful flight in 1903 and National Maple Syrup Day. 
December 18th, the great baseball player Ty Cobb was born in 1886. This is also Ugly Sweater Day. Although I think some of those sweaters from the 1980s and 90s still look pretty good to me. I like a lot of bling near the holiday season. Don't you? It's a way to light up the dark days with a lot of sparkle and cheer. December 19th, Oatmeal Muffin Day. Also on December 19th, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, was published in 1843. December 20 is Games Day, and the electric light was first demonstrated in 1879. That reminds me that people who've been to outer space say that the lights shine brighter than ever over the Christmas season, especially the last three weeks before Christmas. What a great way that we light up our world. December 21st is the official first day of winter. It's the day the first crossword puzzle appeared in a newspaper in 1913. It is Look at the Bright Side Day, National Flashlight Day, and Humbug Day for the Scrooges Among Us. <clears throat> December 22nd, the first Christmas lights were sold to decorate a home in 1882. The mercury thermometer was invented in 1714. And back to golf, the U.S. Golf Association was founded in 1894. The 23rd, the Federal Reserve System in our country was established in 1913 to guard and protect our monetary system. December 24th, a holy night, Christmas Eve. It's also National Eggnog Day. And it's the day in 1968 when Apollo 8, an unmanned flight, first reached the moon. Of course, December 25th is Christmas and National Pumpkin Pie Day. December, December 26th is called Boxing Day in England. It has to do with receiving boxes full of presents, I believe. It is when Kwanzaa begins, which uh, was invented by an African-American man to celebrate the way that Africans have such a beautiful, diverse culture. The 27th is Visit the Zoo Day, and it's when the World Bank was created in 1945 after World War II it ended. December 28th, Card Playing Day, Chewing Gum came along in 1869, National Chocolate Day, and then we quickly moved to December 31st, New Year's Eve. So we have a lot of wonderful things to think about and celebrate as we do every week. Now let's look at some Christmas traditions. It's a time of year when it's getting very cold and I have these wonderful paintings by uh, Thomas Kincaid. This is, I want you to see there, it's getting cold. People are wearing overcoats and jackets. There's a nip in the air and they're coming over. It looks like they're going to get some hot dogs. It looks like this is back on the East Coast and you see a winter sunset happening. What about four o'clock, 4.30 in the afternoon? And as that's happening in the city, out in the country, the animals are foraging, foraging for food. And looking across a half frozen stream at the bright lights of a cozy country home. And the people are tucked inside with warm blankets and hot cups of coffee and hot chocolate and marshmallows. And they are enjoying 
the winter as it's coming on. And when we look up into our hills, what do we see up there? We see the winter storms. We're supposed to be having one this week, even in our own area. And the mountains are lightly dusted with snow. I think he painted this in Northern California. We certainly do get our storms down here, not often, but there is snow coming in the higher elevations, which means people will be getting their skis and heading to Big Bear and heading to Lake Arrowhead. I love these pictures. And then, of course, one of the wonderful winter sports. And there's an ice skating rink not too far away. But this, I believe, is Rockefeller Square. I'm not sure. It could be a skating rink anywhere. And I'm happy to report the roller rinks are open again. People are out there skating. They may be wearing a mask. But the kids are out there laughing and working up that wonderful energy they always have. And it's another winter sport. And as the winter progresses, we come to our Christmas customs. There's a wonderful website, <clears throat> christmas.com. And it was started in 1994 as an effort to share how Christmas is celebrated around the world. And it's always changing, but they have music, recipes, features and information of the past. And they, their goal is to someday have information for every country in the world. They have now over 387 worldview entries or articles, and they're filling in more of the gaps every day. And so it's pretty interesting to see. They have Christmas greetings from around the world in different languages. But I want to tell you some of the customs that we know. <clears throat> Many Christmas customs are based on the birth of Christ, such as giving presents because of the wise men who brought presents to the baby Jesus. Christmas cards based on Christ's birth and scenes of the birth with figures of shepherds, the wise men, and animals surrounding the baby Jesus. But some of the ways that people separate, celebrate have nothing to do with the birthday. Many bits from older holidays have crept into Christmas. And at the same time, we have another holiday, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, which is the festival of lights. And we talked about that last week in great detail. But it was not until about 200 years after Christ's death that Christians thought about celebrating his birth. People chose December 25th to turn people away from celebrating other holidays then. This is a nice little drawing that probably from a Christmas card. And shows what the nativity may have looked like. Saturnalia was the Roman holiday celebrated in December. It was a time of feasting and parties. In Northern Europe, there was a holiday known as Yule and they brought in a great big Yule log and put it in the fireplace. They would make great fires and dance around them yelling for the winter to end and go away. In time, Christmas took the place of these holidays. But we did keep the old custom of burning a Yule log and having feasts and parties. And the word Yule is still used as a name for the Christmas season. New customs have crept in. One was the Christmas tree brought to us from Germany. And last but not least is Saint Nick, named for Saint Nicholas. And we talked about Saint Nicholas Day last week came from the country of Turkey. He helped children in need. And many years after his death, he was made a saint and became the patron uh, saint of cities and countries and children. <clears throat> Excuse me.
Red and green means it's Christmas time. Green is a throwback to the pagan winter festivals where greenery was used, like you see up above my fireplace. Green comes from the pine tree and the holly, which retain their color in the winter. Red is a little bit more open to debate. It could be the blood of Christ, but it also has to do with holly berries or the increased popularity of red in 19th century England and America. The liturgical colors of Christmas, the official ones, tend to be white and gold. Red can represent the robe worn by Santa Claus. Although historically, St. Nick was also portrayed in a blue, green, or brown robe. In 1931, the Coca-Cola Company used its signature red color to dress Santa and market its products of Christmas. So that's part of it. And of course, there's lots of other Christmas holidays. And I wanted to read you something I thought was cute. A friend of mine, I've quoted poems from her before. Mary Raymond writes these wonderful poems. She's a senior in the NOCE program. This one is called Camels. <clears throat> this is what the wise men were supposed to have written when they went to see the baby in Israel. Some fascinating mammals are dromedary camels. The fat stored in their humps can last for many months. Their curly long eyelashes keep out the sand and ashes while toting heavy packs or people on their backs. They trudge on padded feet and never mind the heat. Beware, you could be kickable. Their moods are unpredictable. And another one, Otanin Balm. Christmas trees, oh Christmas trees, aggravating allergies. Well, that's me. Sneezing, blowing, scratching, itching, drippy nose and eyelids twitching. Now that I have found the reason for this snuffy, stuffy season, even though the change seems drastic, this year's tree is made from plastic. Yes, I'm afraid that's me. And to get that wonderful fresh pine smell, I burn pine scented candles. And then one that I love about Christmas cards, although that tradition does seem to be fading out some, but people send a lot of Christmas emails. A Christmas note is sent to you. Once more, I want to keep in touch with cherished friends, both old and new. I like your letters very much. Your photos, babies, children, teens, their weddings, news of joy or strife, your grandkids and vacation scenes, progressive chapters in your life. If you should move, please let me know and send a forwarding address. Although the years may come and go, good friends mean lasting happiness. And I second that. Thank you to Mary Raymond. And back a little bit more to some Christmas customs. I talked a little bit about painting. I wanted to show you some older paintings that I think are such beautiful art. Rest on the Flight into Egypt by Gerard David. These are from Modern Maturity Magazine, which later uh, became ARP, Association for Retired People. And you know, I actually got these pictures from my grandmother probably 30, 40 years ago. Been around a long time, well-worn as you can see. This one is Madonna and Child with Angels by Hans Memling. You can see they dressed them somewhat in the period, period clothing. But that's all right. We just admire it. And inside Adoration of the Kings. You know, the lights are kind of shining on it. You can see. Actually, the kings historically were thought to have showed up about two years later. 
So they would have gone back to a uh, part of Galilee where the baby was raised. They would not have been at the stable. <clears throat> Christmas customs, here's a historian in Colonial Williamsburg that wants to talk to us about the heritage of how early Americans celebrated Christmas. It was a lot different. Christmas in Colonial Virginia, 18th century customs, church, dinner, dancing, some evergreens, visiting, and more of the same for those who could afford to do more. For me, I have to plan meals, go shopping, bake cookies, write a hundred cards, stuff stockings, even for my adult children, and recycle the hundreds of catalogs that have begun arriving back in October. I attend church, stick some holly on the window, fix a big ham dinner, <clears throat> go to one party and then the next. But we have a tree with lots of lights and all my favorite ornaments over the years. Back in the 18th century, children were considered very important and Christmas was a big part of it. A 1773 diary entry mentions the balls, the fox hunts, the fine entertainments. Now, none of that was meant for kids, of course, and the youngsters were not invited to attend. Sally Carey Fairfax in Virginia was old enough to keep a journal and old enough to attend a ball at Christmas in 1771. So she was not one of the tiny tots with their eyes all aglow. <clears throat> The emphasis on Christmas as a magical time for children came about in the 1800s. And we have to especially thank the Dutch and the Germans for centering Christmas back in the home and within the family circle. Williamsburg shopkeepers placed ads noting items appropriate as holiday gifts, but they celebrated New Year's Day as much, if not more, than December 25th. Cash tips, little books, and sweets were given by masters or parents to their dependents, whether slaves, servants, apprentices, or children. Children did not give gifts to their elders. Gift-giving traditions from several European countries worked in a one-way fashion. St. Nicholas filled children's wooden shoes with fruit and candy. Later, the kids hung stockings by the chimney. Why was there an exchange of gifts among equals? We have to thank good old Americans for deciding to do it that way. That has been the normal way of doing it for the last hundred years or so. Christmas cards, we talked about that. Schoolboys used to fill in with their best penmanship, pages reprinted with special holiday borders. They were called Christmas pieces, but the Christmas card itself, starting out as a postcard on very hard cardstock, was an 1800th century English invention. Garlands and greens for the midwinter holidays came from whatever natural materials looked attractive. And they had to watch for the necessary candles, which they did put on Christmas trees, but they did not want them catching fire. Did colonists decorate their homes for the holidays? We don't really know. We have to rely on 1700 century English prints. It does show a little bit of Christmas decoration, but a large cluster of mistletoe is always the main decoration, which was the kissing plant and people would kiss under it. Plain sprigs of holly or bay filled vases and other containers and were set on windowsills. And of course, Christmas trees came in 
with uh, <clears throat> Queen Victoria and her beloved Prince Albert from Germany. About the same time, a German professor at the College of William and Mary trimmed a small evergreen to delight the children at the St. George Tucker House. And Mrs. Martha Vandergriff at the age of 95 recalled that first occasion. She remembered the tree and who decorated it more clearly than she did the date. The newspaper gave 1845 as the time, three years after the German professor's arrival in Williamsburg. Christmas food and beverages, everybody wanted more and better things to eat and drink for a celebration. That always depended on how much money you had saved up for the occasion. <clears throat> Christmas was the right time for slaughtering. There was fresh meat of all sorts and some seafood, preserving fruits and vegetables. Well, they had beef, goose, ham, and turkey. Some had fish, oysters, and minced meat pies and brandy peaches. Now, they would use brandy because it was a good way to preserve the fruit. Slave owners gave out portions of rum and other liqueurs to their workers at Christmas time. And uh, what else happened? 18th century Anglicans prepared to celebrate the nativity during the advent. And there would be a parade and a festival for the 12 days of Christmas, which lasted until January 6th, which is called the 12th day of Epiphany. And that's when the wise man was recognized. Of course, today it seems like we celebrate from Thanksgiving on, and some people from Halloween on. I have one more quick story for what happens after Christmas, and that's called sugar on the brain. Bursts of sugar send a surge through the body that has a major effect on the mind. This is an article from the Epoch Times by Conan Milner. Large-scale studies show that excess sugar consumption can raise the risk of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Then you get a chronic inflammation as a reaction to it. Sugar can affect your mental state, says Dr. Terrilyn Sell. So what do we do? We know there is a high link between sugar consumption and depression and schizophrenia. So not to get depressed, but there are things you can do. <clears throat> what do you do? You need to eat lots of protein to balance it. Eggs, cheese, nuts, peas, beans, or a protein shake at least an hour after you get up. And then you're doing your body a huge favor. If you're going to have a snack before bed, don't make it a sugary one, but a protein one. And then that will help you sleep better too. It's the sugar that gives you poor sleep. Make sure your blood sugar is stable before you go to a family function. A lot of people think they should not eat before they go to a holiday meal, but <clears throat> you don't want to go in a state of hypoglycemia. Stay with the protein throughout the day. And I think that's great advice. If you're going to have a dessert, uh, you can have fresh fruit, cinnamon sprinkled apples or peaches, a special sugar-free ice cream. You know, there's a lot of good candies these days that use sugar substitutes. And of course, there's a debate on whether that's good or not. But whatever you decide to do to keep yourself staying sweet, remember this piece of advice. If you're trying to lose weight, they say that maintaining through the holiday season is actually a sign of success. So don't worry too much about counting the carbs or calories till after the holiday is over. And that will be the time we set our New Year's resolutions. So here's looking 
forward to a brand new 2022 and wishing you, your friends and family, the merriest of seasons. Merry Christmas, everybody. I will see you in person next year and we will start all over again.